morning. So we're going to be in John 3 today. It says, now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I heard a uh, story about a girl, and her family who were, a girl and her family who were leaving church one Sunday, and they were all in the car, and they're driving home, and this girl is, is just crying, sobbing, inconsolably. And the father turns to the girl in the car and, and says, What's wrong? Why are you so upset? What's the problem? And the girl says, Well, the pastor preached that he wanted all of us kids to grow up in good Christian homes. But I want to stay with you. <laughs> Here in John, we have a, a passage about identity and, and transformation in the kingdom of God. And people have taken this passage from John in various ways. Some have taken it as a, a clear declaration about the necessity of baptism, really to try to scare people into the water. Basically, if you don't get dunked, then... God will say to you what my Old Testament professor, Mark Hamilton, said to us in school about cheating. You will fail and I will hate you forever. <laughs> the thing is, this, uh, <clears throat> this notion doesn't really show up here in John at all. That's not really the point of the passage at all. In the same way that an into invitation to friendship and devotion and commitment is not a threat. If your invitations into friendship and commitment take the form of threats, then you're doing it wrong. Instead, what we have in this, pa in this passage in John, and really a theme throughout the book, is an idea of what it means to devote ourselves to God. And here again, there are many ways of thinking about this. 
One way of thinking about this, about what this means, is to identify this kind of devotion with good behavior or with a particular set of activities that we're expected to perform, like going to church the right number of times, behave the right sort of ways, avoid the right sort of things, vote for the right party, get the right bumper stickers. On God's side, God is, is often cast as the angry authority out to smite and condemn us. God the Father in this picture is really upset and hot and bothered and sends God the Son so that God the Son can get God the Father to not be quite so angry anymore. And the solution here is to somehow get God to be pacified and soothed, <coughs> soothed and appeased. But, I mean, for one thing, this, it doesn't make sense to divide God against God's self in this way. And then in terms of this, this passage and others, it doesn't really capture what Jesus is, is talking about here. He's expressing, for one thing, something much deeper than surface-level behavior. He's talking about the root and ground of our behavior. And notice that the emphasis here and elsewhere in John is not on divine rage and then pacification, but on divine love. God so loved the world that he sent his son, it says. And God sent his son not to condemn, but to save the world, it says. The story of li Christ's life and death and resurrection don't cause God to sort of stop hating and start loving us. The whole story, indeed the whole story of creation and of redemption, is from and for love. The story of Christ's life and death and resurrection are rooted in the love of God. The love of a God who never stops having love for us. And when we see this notion fleshed out for the people following Jesus, notice the language he uses here. Not transactions to fulfill our part of a bargain, but the language of birth and rebirth. When he talks of this new kind of life, Jesus is referring not simply to a, a kind of superficial good behavior or a set, a set of particular good deeds we're expected to perform or some policy that we identify with or a political party, but rather an image that conveys an entirely new existence, a rebirth, though not importantly a replacement. It's a drawing of our whole selves into a new way of life. There's a passage in, uh, in Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters, um, which is, you may recall, a, uh, it's a series of, of hypothetical letters that Lewis wrote, um, which are one half of a correspondence between two demons. One's named Screwtape, the other, the other is named Wormwood. And we have in screw tape letters, screw tapes letters, right? Um, and there's one one of the letters, and obviously these are written from a demon's perspective, a hypothetical demon's perspective, right? And there's one letter where screw tape talks about the smell, the odor of a particular family's house. It says. The whole place reeks of that deadly odor. The very gardener, though he's only been there five years, is beginning to acquire it. Even guests, after a weekend visit, carry some of the smell away with them. The dog and the cat are tainted with it. And a house full of the impenetrable mystery. We are certain it's a matter of first principles that each member of the family must, in some way, be making capital out of the others. They must be using and taking advantage of each other. But we cannot find out how. They guard as jealously as the enemy himself. And, of course, by enemy, screw tape means God. They guard as jealously as the enemy himself the secret of what really lies behind this pretense of disinterested love. The whole house 
is one vast obscenity. It bears a sickening resemblance to the description one human writer made of heaven, the regions where there is only life, and therefore all that is not music is silence. Notice when Lewis describes this home, this family, he does not just say it's a bunch of people behaving well or a bunch of people who are always performing good deeds. There's something more profound expressed here. He describes this, this family in terms that are broader and deeper. He uses this almost atmospheric, environmental language. There's a cloud about them. There's a scent, an odor that radiates from them and saturates everything and everyone with whom they come into contact. The kind of Christianity he's describing here is all-encompassing, framing everything they think and do. It's an enveloping way of life rather than simply a reference to one part of their lives or some set of activities that they perform. It's a new way of being and seeing altogether. The defining feature of this, this atmosphere, what makes it toxic and disgusting and repulsive to screw tape, is what Lewis describes repeatedly in the book as disinterested love. By that he means the kind of love that's not rooted in self-interest disinterested love. The kind of friendship and partnership and love for others that is rooted, first of all, in seeking the other person's good. What's good for the other person? Not simply wishing or hoping for their good, but actively seeking it. Lewis gets this idea from Scripture, and he's echoing the thought of other earlier Christian thinkers, many others. Love, real Charity, not the kind of dried out version we think of in our culture, but real charity, real love, is this way. To have this kind of love is to do actively whatever is in our power, to bring about what's good for the other, for their sake. Instead of loving them or connecting to or befriending others primarily because of their usefulness to ourselves which turns people into objects to be used for our own gain. This kind of disinterested love, Screwtape says over and over, is against their first principles, the defining ideas, the defining foundation for their understanding of things. As Screwtape says in another passage, instead of creation and life being rooted ultimately in and aiming towards love, from Screwtape's perspective, everything has its very identity, its very being, in conflict, in use and consumption of everything else. He says at one point that the philosophy of hell, the central, all-defining idea, is competition. In that passage, he makes it clear that, as far as he understands it, what it means to be at all is to be in competition. I am and you are and each thing is only insofar as it pushes everything else out of the way or takes advantage of it, seeks its own good, consumes everyone and everything else. Since this is the way that he thinks about the nature of things, he can't even see into this family's house, the house in the passage that I read a moment ago. The kinds of relationships that permeate and saturate this home are beyond his conception. And so they're beyond his perception. His understanding of it shapes the way that he perceives it and interacts with it. And so Lewis describes Screwtape and his nephew Wormwood as not being able even to understand or make any sense out of relationships that aren't built on competition and conflict and self-interest. This, of course, is in stark contrast to the conception of things, the understanding of what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven. Instead of conflict, competition, and consumption, there is ever-growing, transformative, and creative love. Instead of chaos, there's beauty and life. Instead of noise, there's music. 
Christian faith, Christian devotion is, as Lewis describes beautifully here, something that redefines every facet of our being and redirects it all ultimately toward love, the love of God and the love of neighbor. One example of this, one facet of this that Jesus mentions in John 3 is sight. As we see in the case of screw tape, one way of looking at the people around me, one way of doing that is to see them mainly for what I can get from them. Co to connect with and see them only for the sake of the things that they can give to me. They are a means toward the gaining of my good. But to have the new eyes of the kingdom of God is to give our eyes and our minds alongside them over to be transformed. So that our very perception of people and things is different. Irradiated with divine light. With the result that these people and things around us become different kinds of things. Or maybe a better way of putting it would be not that they become different, but that I finally see them for what they really are. My misperception of them is removed. So that I might begin to see and love as God does. And stop seeing people primarily as objects or means to my own ends. To start seeing them for the people they are, with dignity and equal worth with myself. Another way of putting this would be to say that we must love our neighbors in the same way that we love ourselves. What does that mean, exactly? Well, when it comes to ourselves, we don't stop and say, hold on a second. I'm not so sure about that one. That guy's behavior does not always meet with my approval. He's not always made the greatest or the wisest or the most responsible choices. In fact, he's made some really stupid choices. No, instead for ourselves, simply because we are, we love ourselves. We tend to incline ourselves toward whatever we ourselves think is good without stopping to ask whether the self in question is worthy of that kind of love. Likewise, Simply because they are, we must love our neighbors. We must incline ourselves toward their good, as we do with ourselves. This involves recognizing that other people have an equal right to be and to be well, to flourish, to be heard and seen, whether or not they meet my standard, look or vote like me, or offer me anything in return. This is being reborn of the Spirit. This is seeing the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of the crucified servant, present and growing and at work all around us. This is having eternal life now. Let's pray together. God, give us new minds and hearts. Give us new eyes to see to love as you do. Please fill us with your spirit and bind us together. Teach us to be your loving presence and to receive your love, to see your presence in the world all around us. Teach us your disinterested love. Transform us through the power of your Spirit. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.